Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ventures, a show where my guests and I get to explore entrepreneurial stories, market landscapes, problem spaces, and examine together how new ventures might be able to be created, either for-profit, non-profit, or personal ventures to benefit humanity. Really, the purpose of this show is to educate and inspire a new generation of venture builders and venture investors to make the world a better place. In today's episode, my guest is John Biggs, and he's the editor-in-chief at Gizmodo, and he spent about 15 years at TechCrunch as the East Coast editor there. And while he was there, he got to write about thousands of startups. So he has a ex- very unique and experienced perspective on early stage startup life. And he himself is a, a writer, a technologist, an entrepreneur. And so we dive into a wide range of topics, 5G, blockchain, the future of work, advice for writers. And we talk about his new book, Get Funded, where he has some very wise and direct advice for entrepreneurs that are looking to pitch themselves effectively to raise capital for their venture. So if you are listening to this show, you can watch it by visiting wclittle.com and there we'll have some extended show notes for the different topics and books that we talk about today. And if you are watching this show, you can listen to it anywhere that you get your podcasts. You can just search for ventures. So with that, please enjoy this conversation with John Biggs. All right, John, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Yeah, I'm curious to just tell us a little bit about about your background first. Curious a little little more about you. Yes, I've been a... I've been an entrepreneur for a couple of years. Uh, I was also East Coast editor of TechCrunch. So I worked there for about 15 years. And now I'm editor in chief of Gizmodo. Basically, I stopped entrepreneurial stuff so I could go hang out with these guys. Uh, that's been an interesting move, but it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Awesome. So tell us about so your time at TechCrunch. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I mean, my goal over at TechCrunch was to make small startups uh bigger basically uh, i would write about as many as i could i talked to as many as i could we went around the world uh doing events with TechCrunch. it's just trying to get founders together in the same room so they could meet each other and then they could uh, they could start working together i also wrote a book called get funded which is basically just about getting funded it's all the best best practices i learned over the years uh from my own startups from um my co-writer Eric Valines, and uh, and from just working with startups and at TechCrunch. That's great. That's great. Mm-hmm. So, what advice do you have when you encounter somebody? They have a day job, they have an idea, they're interested in potentially pursuing that idea. What's kind of the if you get that that phone call from a friend? What, what how do you kind of start that conversation? Um, I mean, the answer to that is you have to be ready to build it yourself. you the, uh, the idea that you can basically just have an idea and get funded is fairly difficult right now, unless you're like, unless all the stars align, unless you go to Stanford, unless your professor is really into, I don't know, nanotechnology and knows that you're really good at it. Um, so it's crazy hard to do anything outside of basically your own sweat equity. If you want to build something, you basically have it, have it built for you or you build it yourself you learn how to code you figure out you figure out how things work that sort of thing um i've built um four i guess five businesses over the past few years uh two of them are going constantly and we took we took funding for the ones that failed right Mm uh because if you don't have that you don't have that um if it's a big hairy audacious goal uh, and you don't have enough funding, you basically hit this sort of um, this valley of death where you can just get far enough to crash, which is deeply frustrating to a founder. And, and I'm sure it's happened multiple times. Um, that's why the simplest and best businesses are the ones that you can self fund, that you can self build and that, that uh, cater to your specific skills. If you're really into, I don't know, cannabis growing, uh, uh, don't create a logistics system for transferring cannabis across across uh, state borders. It's going to be too expensive. There's going to be too many legal things. Start out with something small. Start out with some sort of delivery service locally, that kind of thing. 
Uh, and that's just an example that I had uh, because I was talking to somebody recently about that. Um, start small and grow. Uh, if you have to get big, if you have to start big, then that's a whole different type of that's a whole different type of startup, and that's and that's a whole different type of set of skills. So, in, in your own personal journey, I'm I'm just curious where how did when did you know that you wanted to be a writer, and and what was that that early career moves kind of look like? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to be a writer since I was a kid. I think I still have like a novel I wrote in uh, I wrote in high school here somewhere. But I also wrote an uh, operating system in high school. So I wrote a shell for DOS basically um, back when I was doing these things. So I, was, I had the best of both possible worlds. My goal there was to, was to write about things that I loved and I loved computers. So I was able to do that. I started in, um, I went to Carnegie Mellon for information systems and creative writing worked for the paper there. I graduated. Uh, I worked as a consultant for a couple of years doing like COBOL coding and all this other goofy stuff nice. back in Y2K. And then I uh, quit that to get a master's in journalism. So I got a master's in business journalism from NYU. And the goal there was to, because I understand, understood business and tech implicitly, I was able to be useful uh, from two sides of the coin. I could write about it and I could also, um, I could also create it. So I created a thing called Tech for Reporters, for example, which is basically a website where people can go and ask questions, ask hard tech questions of a bunch of technologists. Uh, the trick is, is journalists just don't think that they need those tools. Uh, I think they're going to slowly but surely figure that out. They think they already they know it all. Uh, God bless them for that. But, uh, but I don't think that's the case a lot of the time. Mm. So then as you kind of progressed and you decided to start a, 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 what sounds like a variety of ventures of your own, tell us a little bit about that. Just this, the process of now that you've been writing about it for years and then you decide to dive in on yourself. Like how can you tell us about that story? Yeah. So, I mean, I was, I had the idea to start a, um, to start a cryptocurrency based remittance system because I had seen, I had seen crypto kind of uh, grow over the past few years, uh, over the past years, right around, uh, right around 2014 is when it kind of hit uh, 2011 to 2014. Uh, it was, there was a big run up. Everybody was really excited about it. And it seemed like something that I wanted to be part of. Uh, we started the company. I quit the full-time, full-time work at TechCrunch. I started doing, started doing uh, writing for them, uh, sort of like a, f a freelancer. And I started trying to build this thing out. Um, and what we discovered pretty quickly is we bit off more than we could chew. And again, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to dissuade anybody from, from following their dream, et cetera. Uh, but there are, there are a number of, um, there are a number of warning signs, especially if you have heavy, uh, heavy legal bills associated with this particular company. Hmm. Uh, that's, that's a, that's kind of a warning sign. Um, the MVP is exactly that minimum vial product. And the goal for your MVP should be that I can exist in a vacuum without having to go talk to, I don't know, the SEC. Right. And there are plenty of companies that actually will create and will build and will completely ignore uh, the associated vagaries, uh, legal, uh, financial, et cetera, and just build and go. Uh, but those companies either do federal time or they, uh, they, they're in Malta somewhere. Right. So in that particular world, that's the way, that's the way it was done. And if you weren't careful, you could go to jail. The same thing could be true of almost any modern technology, um, AI, um, cloud, cloud services, that sort of thing. If you piss off enough people, you can really screw up. So that's one way to think about it, I guess. So obviously, you know, the crypto world is, <laughs> Lots of little, uh, lots of large conversations to be had there, but you know, the overall arc, everybody 2017 doing their ICO thing and mm -hmm. haven't been able to, to deliver their projects going through crypto winter. Now everything's DeFi. Kind of what's, what's your overall take? Just a little side comment there. What's, what's I mean, your, I think it's, I think it's all garbage ultimately. Uh, I think it's, I think it's just a bunch of people lying to each other about how much money they're going to make. Uh, there are going to be some winners in this space and that technology is going to be useful, but it's not going to be useful in the way that, um, it's not going to be useful in the way that we think. I think you just really have to, uh, you have to take a lot of what they say with a grain of salt, obviously, 
Uh, and anything a crypto person tells you uh, in terms of success is pretty much a lie. Uh, that's my take. I worked at Coindesk for a year uh, and I, I talked to plenty of these folks. God bless them. They're trying their hardest and they're really nice people. Uh, but yeah, there's no, there's no there there. That said, I think the technology has, has legs. I think technology is important and it's going to be an important backbone for the rest of the internet. So it's going to be pretty cool on that front. So you do see a future where decentralization and, and distributed ledgers have, have a place in the technology landscape? In the, in- yeah, but it won't, be, it won't be some huge project where we like, I don't know, distribute, distribute I don't know, we create, we create a cryptocurrency, global cryptocurrency. It's going to be all like behind the scenes. Just like Linux runs everything from our websites to our phones, you're going to be in a situation where, yeah, the crypto can be used to transfer money. But is it going to be used to transfer money from me to some, I don't know, gangster in, in Ukraine? Probably not. It's going, to be, it's going to be the backbone of a brand new SWIFT system, for example. Yeah. Got it. So then, other so then your other journeys. So it sounds like you've done a, a variety of them. What which which ones can you tell us about? I'm curious, just from a learnings for the entrepreneurs listening in. Yeah, I mean, we did another app called Jaywalk, which was uh, you walk and get money. Uh, we basically aimed at a a marketplace idea where the where the uh, where the merchants would sign up and add themselves to the system, and they would just give discounts for walking. And we wanted to do sort of a health thing. That kind of took off. Um, we had some solid uptake, and again, we entered that valley of death, and the and the business model just wasn't there. And eventually, you have to, if you wake up enough times uh, in a cold sweat, thinking that this is a bad idea, it probably is a bad idea. So, we scrapped that. I mean, the two successful things that I've done is called one's called Typewriter, which is basically just editorial on demand. Um, you can go on, you can upload your app, you can upload your document and have it edited. Uh, we also built cheap transcription.io, which is basically just 10 cents a minute sent transcription via AI or 75 cents by humans. Um, and then I also created a software house called visible magic. So I have these three businesses that scratched my own itch. They were super easy to build cheap transcription took a couple weeks. Uh, um, I wrote, I wrote tech for reporters myself. I coded that myself. Cheap transcription is basically hosted by myself. There's really nothing. There's really nothing associated with it. Could we throw two million dollars at any one of these things and really and really set the fire? Absolutely. Is it worth giving up parts of my business? Is it worth selling um, selling that business to someone else uh, to do that? Probably not. Uh, if I if I have to support thirty people and I feel that my business requires that and there's enough tax incentive, there's enough business incentive to do that, then yeah, absolutely, I'd start, I'd start uh, pitching to VCs. Uh, but as it stands, these things work just fine without outside in, uh, in interference. Got it. So for the, the technologists listening in, um, there's a lot of opinions about what technology stacks to use when building a new startup. Assuming somebody is, is just wants to get something out quick, and is look genuinely looking for advice about what technology stack to potentially use to do mm-hmm. that. I'm curious, do you have any any strong opinions there or, or, or preferences or recommendations for folks? I mean, everything requires some understanding of coding. So my recommendation would be just to learn Python, JavaScript, and PHP. Uh, you can do that in a weekend, basically, each one of those. That's not that difficult. Um, and in terms of how to how to what technology stack i like uh i like php based things right now i've been coding in laravel a lot recently uh simply because it's the routing is really easy you basically just set set up your routes you set up your controllers and you're done and it works really well there's lots of plugins associated with it uh i got into uh i got into react for a minute i just didn't want to to maintain it and i found laravel to be a lot easier and um and django was fun too um, but it just didn't, it didn't, uh, didn't call to me the way PHP does. I'm a, I'm an old coder. So basically PHP was one of my first languages, uh, after active script or whatever we were coding back in uh, 1998. Right. Yeah. Those were the days. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, all right. So I'm very curious to learn about your new book. A uh, lot of entrepreneurs listening in that are just curious about how, you know, they're, they're raising money in various flavors. They're spending their own money. You know, they're, 
making all kinds of mistakes, probably spending too much with uh, mm -hmm. agencies in their local startup community. Then they raise some friends and family money and they kind of jack up their cap table and whatnot. So I'm curious, just what, what was the motivation behind the book? And maybe just tell us uh, a little bit about, um, about what it's about. Um, I mean, I think the, the motivation was that nobody tells it straight when it comes to funding. Everybody, everybody thinks the, 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 uh, entrepreneurs think that funding is like some kind of magic bullet that's going to save them. It's not, it's a, you're basically giving away or selling parts of your business to strangers who may or may not have your best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. Uh, the VCs that I met are nice in person, but on the aggregate, they're, they're basically degenerate gamblers. So you got to watch out for that. Uh, they're going to take a flyer. And once, once they do take a flyer on you, uh, you had better be performing uh, in the top 1% of their portfolio or else you don't get extra resources. Mm. Um, I've also seen a lot of scammers out there. Uh, a lot of weirdos who try to sell contacts, that kind of thing, which is just completely ridiculous. And anytime you have to pay to pitch, anytime you have to pay to, uh, to talk to a VC, then you're being scammed, uh, is the take. Um, and that's, and I try to mention that as well when I'm, when I'm in the book. And ultimately I think the book talks about how to pitch, how to create your, um, how to create your, uh, elevator pitch, how to create your deck how to talk about your startup intelligently, how to prep yourself for like a TechCrunch disrupt, that sort of thing. There are, uh, there are only a few services out there that, I, that we recommend and we talk about each one. We talk about crowdfunding, we talk about equity crowdfunding, uh, also talk about token sales. And, um, and we try to talk about just about every potential way of getting funded and what you have to do to be prepared for every single one of those. And it's not just about meeting the right VC at the right time. It's about pitching correctly. It's about being ready. Um, interestingly enough, by the time you're ready to take funding, a lot of startups don't need it. So that's the, uh, that's the deepest and most frustrating aspect of this whole thing. Mm. So I'm curious just on, on those, on, on the crowdfunding aspects and on, on some semblance of a token sale. So let's start mm -hmm. first with, and, and obviously they're kind of, it can be intertwined, obviously. What from a crowd, what's the crowdfunding landscape look like right now? And kind of how, what, how do you advise founders through that right now? I rarely advise. So ultimately I would love, I would love to be able to crowdfund equity crowdfund. And I would especially love to be able to equity crowdfund through tokens. Unfortunately, uh, the, the family offices, the pension funds, all these guys, these guys think this is all garbage. They're going to completely ignore it. So you're kind of stuck with, with, uh, communities of investors, quote unquote, who hang out on telegram or whatever, and may or may not pump and dump you or do whatever they want to do. Uh, so it is the wild west. So in my, in a perfect world, every startup, no founder, startup founder should have to talk to a VC. They should talk to the people who love their product and want to buy their product immediately. And that's, that's come true when it, term, when it comes to Kickstarters, uh, Indiegogos, that sort of thing for hardware. But it's not so true when it comes to services or businesses or that, that sort of thing. Um, and again, there's, there's, plenty of, there's plenty of reasons not to do that, uh, especially with the uh, boiler room stuff from the 90s, 80s. Uh, but at this point, it's you have to be able to do that because it's completely ridiculous. That said, a lot of these crowdfundings, equity crowdfunding organizations are, uh, are just on the border of scams and usually on the border of being completely ineffectual. So I never recommend it uh, in, terms of, in terms of equity crowdfunding. An ICO is nice if you live in Malta or whatever, or, or I don't know, Belarus, where you can just get away with it. Mm. Uh, and I would love to not have to say that, but I think it's a, uh, I think that's something that everybody has to think about. Um, yeah, I mean the the it's like getting published. Uh, self publishing is a way to go, and it's a and it's a uh, it's a good idea. Uh, is it the same as getting signed by an eight with an agent and getting through a publisher and having actual distribution? Do you get the same benefit in terms of um, reach, respect? Uh, and I guess readership that you would do uh, if you self-published, probably not. Uh, if you did, if there, if you've published, if you got uh, went through a publisher, probably not. 
And if that's important to you, that's some that's a that's a consideration. Then that's something to consider, or something to think about. So I guess that's the long way of saying is that they're just not there yet. Mm. Got it. So then, so so would you recommend against anything token sale oriented? I mean, oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, this is not the this is not the environment for it. If you can pull it off, you can figure out how to how to sneak your way through. And usually, if you do it in Switzerland or you do it in some other jurisdiction. But at that point, your 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 dad's a millionaire anyway, so all this is all this all the points are moot here, uh, and you're you're only you're only uh, the only benefit of running an ICO is that you just get slightly richer as opposed to going from zero to uh, funded. So in your world in in, in in writing, let's say a college student really passionate about writing really passionate about writing about technology, kind of how do you advise college students today? Like if, if they're thinking about entering, entering the world, it's, it's obviously very different than when you were getting into it. Yeah. I mean, I think there's the, 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 the process of going from, uh, going from thing to thing is very difficult at this point, uh, going from job to job. There are only a few jobs out there. Uh, and it's really important to have some sort of niche, some have some sort of specific skill. I also wrote a book called Bloggers Bootcamp, and it's basically just about finding your niche and finding out how to write uh, mm-hmm. intelligently for for an audience. Um, the those niches are being filled by people with special skills, data science skills, programming skills, that sort of thing. There is a place for I don't know the art history major to go and work for a magazine and and have an acceptable job over the next I don't know twenty years, uh, but that that window is rapidly closing. Uh, and if you're not skilled in, in some particular thing that can make you useful and you're a good writer, uh, then you're kind of, you're kind of sunk. Um, that's not to say you have to go learn to code because journalists don't like to hear that, but, uh, yeah, you kind of have to go learn how to code. Got it. So what sort of things are you the next year or two for you personally? What, 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 what kind of projects are you working on and what, what is the, the, the near to medium, medium term future look like for you? Uh, I'm going to be hanging out at Gizmodo for a while. I like the, I like the crew over there and I like the opportunity. It's a lot of fun. And it's, it, I used to be editor in chief of Gizmodo back in 2004 or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. And now I'm back. Uh, so it's good to watch. It's good to watch it grow. Um, and then in terms of, um, in terms of projects, I'm working on a uh, tag team writing and editing uh, app that basically just lets uh, lets users write scenes uh, with each other and just like drag them into into um, different chapters. Mm. Uh, so we can do like long form, uh, sort of like a Wattpad, but on steroids. So I'm building that out right now. Yeah, that's really cool. Mm-hmm. Well, then obviously your, your perspective uh, over the course of your career, you've seen a lot of tech trends come and go and lots of people pontificating and all the futurists kind of doing their thing. What's, what, what can we learn from, from the futurists that are all about, you know, the AI taking over the world and, and you know, blockchain and AI and health and bio? Are there any particular conversations in that whole g- gambit of, of topics that are, that are particularly interesting to you? Uh, well, I mean, look, so, so everybody thinks that, uh, that AI is going to take over journalism, for example, which sounds kind of ridiculous if you really think about it. Um, for the lowest type of journalism, which is basically just the reporting of simple fact, absolutely, AI will be able to do that. Uh, for the assimilation, for the synthesis, and for the understanding of these facts and putting them together into a story, it's going to be much more difficult. Uh, that said, the audiences aren't that sophisticated these days so they'll take any piece of garbage that floats across their twitter feed unfortunately so trying to find and create um important and useful pieces of information or or, or news sites is going to be a uh, a big deal over the next decade or so mm-hmm. um and in terms of in terms of what happens next i think we uh, i think we deal and we start working in graphene a little bit more mm-hmm. uh using using better um creating better batteries. And once we have 5G, we'll be, have devices that are the size of, I don't know, a piece of paper that can fold and can last for an entire day on one charge and become ubiquitous, uh, even more ubiquitous than the stuff that we have around us right now. 
And what are the basic, you know, everybody talks about 5G and I, I, I've, I've been in some conversations that are, are kind of blowing my mind in terms of how the future could be drastically different. Do you mm-hmm. think the hype of 5G is, is real or, or, or what's, your, what's your overall take? Uh, so they're claiming, there's claiming 200 megabits per second um, up and down for 5G, which is pretty impressive. I mean, these, these are optimized uh, numbers. I would expect it to be something like a fairly fast uh, connection in the home. And the benefit of that is that we can do what we're doing right now, right? We're sitting in, we're sitting in front of computers and we have, we have a Zoom, Zoom connection running. I have, a, I have a Fios downstairs. It's pretty fast. It's pretty regular. Uh, and because it's, because it's mobile and because it's a little bit better than LT, we're going to be in a situation where um, we're going to be able to maintain a connection for a longer period of time. We're going to be able to understand, we'll be able to connect uh, for uh, much faster from our phones and from our devices. And you could do multiplayer stuff or multi, uh, multi-user multi stuff uh, fairly easily with this. Is it the end all be all? Probably not. I mean, it's going to be just slightly faster than LTE, but it should be a little bit more, um, a little bit more reliable. And, you, you know, obviously the 2020 has just been, Pretty interesting year to say the least. But with regard to the future of work and kind of how everyone's displaced, and do um, you think overall that's that's a good thing, or do you think there are aspects of this that are going to be significantly detrimental to society? I think this has been a good thing. I think it. I think it puts a. It makes work from home a normalized thing in in the world. Uh, because there's no, there's honestly no benefit to going to an office. Ultimately, I mean, yeah, you can go, you can go hug and hug and whatever your coworkers or whatever, uh, and that's fun. But working from home is going to be a new skill that a lot of people may not be able to grasp. And if you can do it really well, uh, you can be useful anywhere in the world versus just in your hometown. So that's going to be a benefit. It's also switching the mindsets of a lot of folks who may or may not be um, more uh, office-minded, uh, older folks who are really into offices, that sort of thing. And it doesn't make any sense for even those folks to go in an office because at this point, everything they figured out that everything works uh, just as it's supposed to. So. So then, just I'm just curious about with writing books for you. I'm curious just to hear the journey about each each of the books. And I know obviously very passionate projects, and I'm curious just to kind of hear an overarching story about this book and why I wrote this book and this book. Because you've written, how, how many now are, are published? I think uh, six. Yeah, I'm curious about just just briefly if you don't mind, kind of walking through each one and and and, and what they're about. Yeah, so I wrote a uh, was it six, no eight. Um, so I wrote I wrote a kids a kids uh, fiction trilogy. Uh, the the last book I basically have to finish uh, about an underground train system, uh, which I had a lot of fun with. I wrote that for my kids. Mm. I also wrote a book about Marie Antoinette's watch, which is about one of the most complex watches ever made. Mm. Um, that was a uh, that was just a labor of love. I really like watches, so I got into that. Uh, I have a book of short stories out, and I also have a uh, a couple sort of more techie books. There's Bloggers Bootcamp, obviously, which is the about blogging. I wanted to do that because I was good at blogging, right? I did eleven thousand posts for TechCrunch, so I might as well tell somebody how to write. I don't know, a hundred. <laughs> and I and my first book was called Black Hat, which was me writing about computer security back in the nineties, uh, late early two thousands. It was actually a lot of fun. It was the uh, it was a good experience. It was a lot of fun to write a write a book back then, and it's uh, and it and I think it did fairly well. And then uh, and then I then get funded was the last one. I also did a um, project with O'Reilly about building building uh, serverless architectures in Azure with this guy from Madrid, Spain. But uh, that's a little less uh, that's a little less exciting. <laughs> so. In the in the overall landscape of technology, it, it, there actually are a number of people probably listening or watching in that would find that particular issue somewhat exciting. Um, what is just just to educate the audience a little bit? What is serverless, and what and why is that at least getting a, getting a lot of attention right now? Yeah, it's hard to um, 
it's hard to it's hard to describe what serverless is without if you're not if you're not haven't used something like Go or uh, or Erlang or some of these bigger these more complex um, they're actually more powerful languages. So uh, serverless in this case is basically you don't you don't run a you don't run a program unless it's absolutely needed. Uh, this reduces functionality. This reduces uh, the drain on a server itself. So, say there's a say you need to bring up a picture of a dog or something like that. So, there's no subroutine that just like finds pictures of dogs. The the subroutine fires up. It finds the picture of the dog and returns the picture of the dog and then shuts back down again uh, as it's needed. That's the easiest way to understand it. There's all sorts of other other ways to think about it in terms of oracles, in terms of uh, subroutines that basically fire off, run while the program is running, and then stop when they're done. Um, but that's less uh, that's less interesting. Um, the The real benefit is that you have completely scalable systems um, for for really complex servers where you can you can do you can pick up data, you can share data, you can do all sorts of things uh, without without the traditional overhead of like MySQL and all the other good stuff that, that you used to use. So it's a, it's really a, it's really, it's, it's a, it's not that complex and it's really useful. Uh, but you have to be in a situation where you really, really need to use it because it's not worth, uh, it's not worth getting in there otherwise. So what books do you recommend for, besides obviously the ones that you've written, um, for founders that are that are curious to learn learn more about how to get in the game, is there anything that come to mind that, that you'd recommend for folks? Um, I like uh, I like negotiating books. Uh, let's see what was I was reading recently. Um, Getting to Yes is a good one. Uh, Pitch Anything is a good book. Um, there's a uh, negotiating. Negotiation for Success. There's a number of them. Uh, Never Split the Difference by Chris Vox is always a fun one. Um, I like those. I like the negotiating ones. What a lot of people, and I think also what people need are um, are histories. Uh, you should you should read histories about uh, about major decisions politically, uh, militarily, that sort of thing to understand the, 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 the our current situations. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no benefit to there's no benefit to um, going through life without understanding that. For example, I re I'm reading uh, Da Vinci by, um, let's see. I know the guy's name. Hold on. Yeah. Walter Isaacson. Mm -hmm. uh, the book is, the book is a little bit dense. It's kind of boring, but understanding that there is a guy out there like Da Vinci who was, who was sort of a polymath who did a little bit of everything kind of gives the entrepreneur uh, license to actually try a lot, lots more stuff. Um, a lot of people say you have to focus on one thing. You have to really, you have to really buckle down. And from my viewpoint, if you're not good at multiple things uh, and you don't understand the synergies between multiple topics, you're basically wasting your time, right? You're yeah. kind of, uh, you're kind of in a situation where you're boxing yourself into a corner. So, uh, so I like, I like to read histories as well. Mm. So on that point, you know, I get a lot of questions about that particular issue, right? Where somebody is really interested in lots of different things. Um, and, and they hear, they hear the advice, they hear the, the, you know, you have to get your 10,000 hours into something in order to become, yeah. an expert. um, I, I, how do you how do you think about it? Because obviously that that threads into education, that threads into sort of advice for people now, and the world's getting kind of shaken up, and uh, the future of work looks kind of interesting. How, how do how do you help net somebody navigate that conversation between? Being yeah, I mean, figuring out what you want to do. So there are people who are good at logistics, who are good at who are good at paperwork, who are good at the day to day. They're at operations, uh, and then there are people good at thinking thinking of stuff right it's like inventing mm. you have to figure out who you are you have to figure out if you're the guy who's going to sit there and going to and going to pound this this uh, service through until the very end uh or are you going to invent the service and let somebody else run it for you and you have to be ready to to make that decision you have to figure out who you are uh when it comes to that 
if you're a polymath, if you like a little bit of everything and you can't focus on one thing, you're not going to be successful as a startup or, uh, if you're a operator, if you're a manager, quote unquote, uh, and all you want to do is sit down and run the day to day, you're not going to be successful as a startup. So you have to find somebody who, who I, somebody who can complement your skills. Mm. Uh, for example, my wife runs two of my businesses for me. We, I invent, I, I become, I'm the Don Draper. I walk in and I do the pitches and things and I get to do, uh, all sorts of other exciting things. And she runs the day to day. She runs the billing. She runs the, uh, hiring and firing that sort of thing. And that's just fine. It's not, it hasn't, it doesn't, uh, hurt anything, but you have to be in a situation where, yeah, you do have both of those skills. Just having the idea is not sufficient by any stretch of the imagination. Um, just building it, being able to build it yourself as a coder is not sufficient either. Uh, the, what's his name? Zuckerberg, uh, Facebook didn't get big until other people came in and said, here's how to run a company. Mm. And here's how to, here's how to roll out. And he had plenty of people. A lot of people thinks this is like a lone genius who can solve these problems and, and become rich. Uh, but what the lone genius does best is to bring other people in on the project. Uh, if you're a, if you're a, let's say a, uh, unethical loan genius, you don't pay them very much. Uh, but in the vast majority of times you probably want to pay them a fair wage and some sort of equity. Uh, and you have to do that as quickly as possible. And one of the benefit, one of the skills that an entrepreneur has to have is the ability to tell a story and get people excited about a story. So I guess that's the answer. Thanks. So what? So it sounds like you're in a bunch of different things right now, and um, really, really interested to hear about what questions are you pursuing right now? Like what what questions, both personally and just sort of macro in the world right now, are you are you most interested in in in, in your curiosity? Yeah. I mean, one of, one of the things is what do we do on earth, uh, in the next 10, 20 years, if we burn ourselves off this planet, where do we go? Uh, and I care about that because I have kids, right? So you want to make sure that they're not going to end up I don't know, on a cinder. Uh, that's a big, that's a macro question on, on a, on a micro scale. I'm worried about, I'm worried about news. I'm worried about information. Uh, I'm also worried about audiences. I think audiences are getting stupider and stupider. Uh, and I mean, I'm part of that. I'm part of that thing. I, I, I don't, I don't go to New York times. I scroll through, I scroll through Twitter mm. and occasionally I'll eat a piece of information that, that rolls by like a freaking goldfish. But, uh, I'm not, I'm not actively hunting down, uh, the best stuff. How do you encourage a populace that's used to free, always on, uh, junk food information to actually, go and eat something nutritious. And that question is, is, is bothers me constantly. It's something that I'm thinking about constantly. Um, mm. How do we, how do we solve that problem? I don't know. And I think, I don't think a lot of other people know too. I think, I think there's a VC Valley view of this whole thing where it's all truth and truth checking and fact checking. And I think those people are, are deluded mm. uh, and naive in terms of what it takes to actually build a news organization. Um, so, basically following that that train of thought how do we become educated consumers how do we become educated people and voters in the next uh in the next decade and it's almost impossible to do uh with the tools that we have now so what are those tools that we need to build to uh, to fix things i mean do you see any glimmer of hope there i mean are there are there uh, are there places where there is meaningful content being built and, and people paying for it uh, I mean, uh, New York times, let's say, mm. um, uh, there are a few su subscription sites like daily beast, that sort of thing that are working. Okay. Uh, TechCrunch had a really good, uh, did a really good job of creating subscription content that's valuable and important and still giving away its regular news. I think a lot of the sites that, that you, that people go to and complain about all the time are, uh, are being, are being given short shrift. Uh, and then all these new aggregators and different things are just complete garbage that are that are causing more problems than they solve. So we're so we're in a position where there are sites that are doing well, but they're not doing well enough to really take off. And then there are then there are VCs and everyone who basically uh, want to fund things where the content is stolen from other sites and shared uh, among a bunch of users. 
Um, and that's not how you build. That's not how you build a educated uh, citizenry. Hmm. Got it. Well, John, hey, I really, really appreciate your time. Where can people learn more about you and uh, and, and find you on, on, on the interwebs? Yeah, I'm just I'm just at John Biggs on Twitter, and you can look at my books at johnbiggsbooks.com. Cool. All right. John, really appreciate your time, man. Appreciate it. All right, super. All right, a couple quick things before you go. Number one, I have a general newsletter where I write about technology and startups, and health science, and teaching people to code. And I write about a variety of different subjects that we talk about on this show. So if you go to wclittle.com, there you'll be able to subscribe. And you'll also be able to subscribe to particular topics. If you're just interested in one or a few of them, you'll be notified right when I publish new content in those areas. Number two, my partners and I at Proto Ventures have a portfolio company called Startup Rocket. If you go to startuprocket.com, there you'll be able to receive coaching guides and customize an operations framework for you and your team and your advisors to be on the same page in terms of what is the appropriate next step for you and your entrepreneurial journey. And finally, if you wouldn't mind leaving a review anywhere that you have listened to this podcast or watched this podcast, it would be super helpful to help those who might be interested in consuming this content as well. Thank you.